Diary of a Man in Despair. Friedrich Reck. October 30, 1942. I watched the first bombing of Munich from a hotel room in Altading, where I have come to examine the material on Tilly located here, a hideous red glare, transforming the autumn night and its full moon. I heard in the distance the muffled booms, and it was calculated that since the bombs were dropping 80 kilometers away, it had taken three minutes for the sound to carry, three minutes during which the victims at the scene had been gasping and gagging and dying. Finally, the whole of the sky to the west was a gigantic sheet of fire. In the days that followed, people spoke of fantastic losses, largely due to suffocation. People were still being dug out five days later, wedged in among fallen beams and rubble, where they had been unable to move. And then there were the dead, whose faces still bore the marks of their last agonies. Since many high-ranking Nazis have private and luxuriously appointed residences in Solm, which the English evidently know, that unlucky suburb was bombed three times in succession. Werner Bergengruen, who lives there, lost all his manuscripts, his collections, the whole of his possessions when his house went. He was seen the next day in a state of shock and despair, perched on the pile of ruins that had been his house, offering passers-by the few things that had survived the Holocaust, a Latin primer, a small bronze, a couple of Chinese objets d'art. Alongside was a hand-lettered placard announcing that this was a special sale by a German writer of the remains of his possessions. The police tried to drive him off, but he defended himself so energetically, and the crowd standing about was so sympathetic, that the gendarmes had to retreat. Her Hitler happened to be in Munich the night of the air raid, and before the alarm had been sounded for the Misera plebs, he was already safely tucked away in a private shelter complete with rugs on the floors, baths and, reportedly, even a movie projection room. Thus, while hundreds and hundreds of people buried under rubble struggled horribly to breathe, he might well have been watching a movie. Naturally, he announced after it was over that everything would be rebuilt, far better than before. Presumably, after some young Canadian turns the Frauenkirch into a pile of rubble, he will assign her spear to help us reconcile ourselves to the loss of this and other cathedrals. I would assume that he is secretly delighted over the loss of our Gothic masterpieces, since he has always wanted to become one of the immortals of architecture, hasn't he already threatened to pull down the Theatinerkirch, the Hofgarten Arcades, and the Luchtenberg Palace to make room for a colossal opera? Here, at Chiem, we are supposed to be getting a leader's school, a kind of stud farm for future chancellors, which would run for a kilometer and a half along the eastern shore of this peaceful lake. The whole quiet shoreline would be transformed into a mass of stone, dominated by a tower 130 meters high. One assumes that the task of his personal architects is to carry out orders, and keep quiet. With the malignant narrow-mindedness of the man marked by the devil, he hates everything that has grown up straight and healthy, and the opposite of himself. With the hatred of the illegitimate, he hates everything that belongs among the precious elements of our tradition, and which does not flatter his vanity. Is it really too much to say, when we view this dangerous gorilla, that we are prisoners of a Neanderthal man who has got loose from his chain? And so we continue to vegetate in our life of shame, our life of dishonor, our life of lies. And our protest, at least the protest of our cowardly bourgeoisie, is in the retelling of old jokes about the regime, while their remaining days are spent swallowing propaganda. Following a series of articles placed by Goebbels in the newspapers, the wife of a tenant came to see me in fear and trembling. In Jesus' name, how was she to protect her children? They were all going to be dragged off to be raised in English, American, or Russian orphan asylums, according to newspapers. Nota Bene, this woman spent several years in America, as a laundress, she still speaks a little English, and she has a number of quite warm recollections of Boston, yet she believes these stories about the foreign devils. Really, this people, only yesterday so intelligent and discriminating, seems to have been overcome by a disease of the mind. They now believe everything they are told, provided it is done with sufficient aplomb. The latest is a story concocted by Goebbels that our so-called leader appeared in some town without previously announcing that he was coming. Nevertheless, there the whole town was, lined up awaiting him, as though some kind of radiance emanating from him had made itself felt in advance. 
If an official of Imperial or Weimar Germany had dared put out such a story, the shout of laughter that would have gone up would have sufficed to send him flying out of office, and would have followed him for the rest of his days. But this is broadcast by the networks, and believed, and digested, without a soul's daring to so much as smile. Literally everything is believed today, if it is printed, or broadcast, or publicly proclaimed under official auspices. If her goring suddenly, and with the requisite blare of trumpets, proclaimed one of his hunting dogs King of Bavaria, I really believe that the same people who only yesterday were so proud of their differentness vis a vis the North German ant heap, and so jealously guardian of their own special characteristics, would shout hurrah and bow down. There is some eerie, impending thing in the air, the whole physical structure of our lives seems to have broken down under the weight of these never-ending lies. For the last nine years, since the coming of Hitlerism, the summers have been concepts on a calendar only, and have drowned us in rainfall like the original flood. Year after year, the vintages have failed. The botanists say that certain plants which normally bloom in the autumn now come up in spring, while there are spring-blooming plants which now emerge in late autumn. I have heard from zoologists on the Eastern Front, in the Northern Caucasus, that tropical snakes formerly native to India are now to be found in the vicinity of the Volga, on the threshold of Europe. Thus, everything is out of joint, the usual order of things has been overturned. And what is this plague that now afflicts Germany, but a disgusting symptom of the same thing? Cle died in August, bitterly, painfully, calling in his death agony to the brother in England he loved most dearly. Eight weeks before that, while black storm clouds lay over the little house on the Pilsen Sea, he had played for me my favorite song from his opera, Li Tai Pee, the melancholy song of the cormorant. I sat beside him, heartsick at those fingers grown thin as matchsticks. Then, in the midst of his playing, blue flame shot between us as lightning ran down a conductor. The lights went out, the fuses were shattered into pieces. It was as though nature was already separating us. Now, I expect every day to hear of the death of his cousin, Erwin von Skonborn, who is in agony in Munich. Yesterday, I was discussing with H. the changing forms of man's cruelty, with particular reference to the horror the Eastern Front has now become, and I remembered something which happened to me almost forty years ago, but which is still, today, fearfully present to me in all its grisly details. I was still a cadet at the time, on a short leave in Königsberg, and a friend of mine from school days invited me to go with him to a session on anatomy. Most of the students were away for the holidays, and only one of the greasy-looking dissecting tables was in use. This was being serviced by an old attendant with a bushy, dirty, grey beard, who was busying himself, at the moment I walked in, with removing the head from a newly arrived corpse. This head had been completely smashed by a revolver shot. I fled, but this old man followed me like a vampire, brandishing his fatty knife, and there, in the corridor, related the story of the corpse. The case was that of a homosexual druggist, who had shot his lover and would-be blackmailer, and then had killed himself. As no one claimed the despised remains, the one-time druggist had ended in the dissecting room. Some cynical twist of fate brought me into contact with the same corpse two years later. Now a medical student, I entered the same room for my first session in dissection, and found before me the livid flesh of the former apothecary. I recognized it at once as the remains of the man who had been brought by his equivocal inclinations to this miserable and apocryphal end. If there had been any doubt, the attendant removed it. That hideous old man served as a kind of ambulatory obituary notice for the poor, disgraced figures on the tables. I will never forget the feeling I had when my hand touched the lumpy flesh for the first time, nor the first cut I made into this flesh. I looked around me. With me, around the same corpse, were three other young students. They faced the same problem as I, and their honest little boy faces reflected the same attempt to fight down their horror and disgust. The whole room was filled with such boys, standing about their hideously bedecked tables, former students of Plato and the verses of the Iliad who had deserted the disciplines of humanism and now found themselves faced with the necessity to jump down into the foul air of decomposition where analysis takes place. We would negotiate this leap successfully, 
and the proof that we would was reflected in the ironic expressions of the instructors and their assistants, and the still more ironical faces of the graduate students. I can remember only one of the beginners present who threw his knife away and never came back. Each of the rest of us set himself and began to work, began at the cost of a shameful metamorphosis of himself, and a subjection of himself to this metamorphosis, which I recall today as a shameful and troubling memory. I do not doubt that all of those present were the well-brought-up sons of a middle class whose position was still unchallenged, I still correspond with several of them, and I know that in their leisure hours they read Baudelaire and find relaxation in an occasional string quartet. I know also that their feeling of horror when they view the orgy of brutality which is today filling the world is akin to mine. But what could we do but drown our disgust in cynicism? Immediately, from the time of that first incision, the entire room was filled with obscene joking, with the whistling of popular tunes, and with laughter that was intended to be casual, but that had a worried and cramped sound. This went on for weeks, and even today, almost a half century later, the memory fills me with shame. The jokes we made as we went about our macabre business became daily more obscene, and more and more grisly comedy was forced out of the positions taken by the corpses, poor puppers that they were and the obscene postures that would have been implied if there had been life in them. That was the only period of my life when existence here on earth presented itself to me as a mean little game played by forces whose nature was raw and massive as a steamroller, a dreary comedy whose title was Interfeces et Uranus, and the depressing conclusion, in the style of the tragedy of Wazik. Of course, there came a time when I gained new understanding, and realized that all this had really been nothing but our defense against the horrible. But what defense is possible now, against the things now rising from the grave, the ghostly train now passing across the dark heavens of these late autumn days? For, from Paris comes word that the Père Lachaise Cemetery has been dug up in a search for Heine's bones, and since no bones were found, and something had to be done, the mold in the grave was excavated and strewn to the four winds. And an informant who was at the scene at the time has told me about the murder of Hervon Carr, who was trampled to death by SS beasts in the courtyard of the Marienbad Hotel, in Munich, twenty-year-old louts and a seventy-year-old man. And H., with whom I philosophize today about man's inhumanity to man. He has just come back from the Eastern Front, and witnessed the massacre at K., where thirty thousand Jews were slaughtered. This was done in a single day, in the space of an hour, perhaps, and when machine gun bullets gave out, flamethrowers were used. And spectators hurried to the event from all over the city, off-duty troops, young fellows with the milk complexion of the young, the children of men, who also, nineteen or twenty years ago, were lying in cribs and gaily bubbling and reaching for the brightly colored ring hanging just above. Oh, degradation, oh, life without honor, oh, thin shell that separates us from the lost souls in whom Satan burns. You judge us and find us wanting, and we, here, suffer in loneliness and dread. You point at us, and at our lack of resistance, and we know that the resistance have died unknown in filthy bunkers, and that the blood of martyrs has been spilled to no purpose, that deeds to match Charlotte Corday's have been done, and never heard of. The devil is loose, and it is God himself who has unloosed him and the Lord will give him great power. And we can only guess at why he has done this, or why he has chosen this land as his stage, or what lies in store for us, behind his curtain. But still the night lies black over our heads, and we suffer, we suffer as you never shall suffer, no, not on your deathbed. Beware, the man who would make light of our suffering, 